All right, picking up where I left off in my last video, a lot of people say, oh, what did God make us robots? Are we puppets on a string? He controls us. He's sovereign, so we just follow his lead and he directs us wherever we go. No, we're not robots. Robots buzz and blink and they can't feel. But the Bible tells us directly what we are. So this comment, oh, does God make us robots? He's in control of everything. No, the Bible says we are clay. We are like clay in his hands. Yes, we are clay. In chapter 9 of Romans, Paul explains this. How could the one being molded protest to the molder? Why do you make me thus? Or as the potter, that's God, the right over the clay which is us. The potter is God, the clay is us. So God forms us the way he wants. He forms some of us to be vessels of dishonor and do evil. He forms some of us to be vessels of righteousness and to do good. That's his choice. And yes, God is sovereign. He dictates everything we do, but we don't feel him doing it. Like we're puppets on a string, like he's pulling my arm up here, pulling my arm up here. We don't feel him guiding us and directing our steps. That's part of this experience on earth. We don't feel God's presence. We don't feel him moving us. He gives us that ignorance, the ignorance of self-determination. Like we make every decision. And in our minds, it seems like we do it. But we are unaware of the influences and our own nature that God puts together since the beginning of his plan that causes us to act the way we do. We're unaware of that. But God is outside of that in the absolute sense directing our steps. So yes, we are clay in the hands of God and he will mold us right down to the nitty gritty details exactly how he wants us. And eventually, whether you're a vessel of dishonor or a vessel of honor, he will bring all of us home to heaven and have the greatest experience imaginable and the greatest joy imaginable, partly because we went through our own individual experience of pain, sin, and death. That's the almighty plan. That's what Jesus did. And that's a great plan. But... It's him that directs us and him that puts us through this evil right now. Going on, um, in chapter 10 of Romans, it talks about a righteousness that is from human beings. So this plays into the free will thing because, like I said before, a lot of Christians say, oh yeah, Jesus died for our sins, but we have to make a decision for him. We have to accept him by our own free will choice. So, in essence, their free will choice puts them over the top to getting saved because without that choice, Jesus died for nothing because he didn't save them. Which we know through scripture, the opposite is true. Jesus took care of sin and death and saves everybody. And then Jesus gives certain people that faith so that if Jesus chooses you, one day you will come to a knowledge of the truth because of Jesus from start to finish saves you. If he doesn't choose you in this life, then you will go through a severe judgment at some point at the great white throne. And then we get into the second death, and I'm not going to talk about that here, but eventually everyone is saved from that second death. But Jesus chooses some now. The rest he chooses later. But every detail in your life will lead you up to that point and Jesus has shaped that so salvation from start to finish occurs because of Jesus Christ so Jesus Christ came to this earth we inherited death from Adam everyone who is born is dying eventually to die that was the consequence of what happened in the garden so we're all on our way to death. We can't stop that. We can't change anything about that. Jesus came here, lived, 
suffered, died on the cross, and was resurrected for us. He took care of everything. He took care of sin on the cross. See, the Christian sits back and watches Jesus get tortured and murdered on the cross, and they say, oh, wow, great act, Jesus. Okay, now what must I do to take care of my sin? What must I do now to be worthy of you, Jesus? Nothing. Just get out of the way. You cannot add anything or do anything more than what the Son of God did on that cross. He took care of sin. He annihilated it. It's gone. I know we don't see that now, but as God sees it one day for us as well, sin will be gone. It will serve its purpose to teach us about evil so that we have an appreciation of good and exactly how much God loves us because there's no greater act of love than sending your son, your own son. There's no greater act of Jesus dying for his own creation. He had to because everybody came out of him. Like I have two children that I love very much more than anything in this world because they're a part of me. I would do anything for them. Well, we are all, we are all a part of Jesus because we all came out of Jesus. We all came out of his divine plan and his creative ability. He created us and gives us life and planned every detail of our life to shape us to be God's own children, every one of us. So he cares that much about his creation. And he wants to show that love, but he can't show it unless there's a backdrop of evil. You can't be a savior and show mercy if there's no horrible thing to be saved from. And we're saved from death. But Jesus did that on the cross. He doesn't need the Christian soldier or the Christian choice or good works to be added to what he did. He took care of sin on the cross. So when he calls a believer, he gives that believer faith. At a certain time in that believer's life, they will come to a realization of the truth. And they will believe and act the way Jesus wants them to. If Jesus doesn't choose you now, then he will choose you later, after judgment. But everybody, whether it's now or later, will come to Jesus and be reconciled to Jesus, therefore reconciled to God because of the death, entombment, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it is all Jesus from start to finish. So chapter 10 of Romans here, Paul says, Indeed, brethren, the light of my heart and petition, blah, 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 that they have, he's talking about believers here, they have a zeal of God, but not in accord with recognition. For they, being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own righteousness, were not subjected to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the consummation of the law for righteousness to whoever is believing. Okay, what this is saying is that these people, these were Jewish believers back in the day, they... believed in Jesus, they understood the cross, but they still thought they had to do things to be worthy of that cross. So at the end of the day, it was their righteousness that was getting them saved. Even though Jesus was the standard, they did some good things here. They believed, did good works, followed the law, so that that activated Jesus' salvation. So they can boast in that, in their righteousness. But that's self-righteousness. And what Paul is saying here is that you have to give up on yourself completely and understand that there's nothing you can do to achieve the greatness of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is making you like him. He is giving you, if you read Ephesians, he's giving you heaven. He's seating you at the right hand in heaven. You're going to be with him, reconciling all of heaven back to God. You are going to be a very, God is going to look at you as he looks at his son. He does that now if you accepted Jesus Christ. If he's given you that faith to accept him, he looks at you right now like that. And he will look at all his creation like that one day. 
But what an honor that is. How could you attain that righteousness of God? You can't. You have to give up on every good. That's why it's so hard for people who are pretty good people to understand the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Because they still think that there, there's good within them, and there might be, but enough good to reach the level of the Son of God? No, the only way you can get there is if Jesus gives it to you. And the minute you say you have to do something to get that, then you're rejecting that Jesus did it all for you. And you're establishing your own righteousness. A test of this is the salvation of all. If you do not believe that every man, woman, and child is saved, so if, say I'm saved and that person over there is not saved, then that means I did something of my own to activate salvation that that person didn't do. So that's self-righteousness. I did it. That's what Paul speaks out against in every one of his letters. You have to put that away and say that there's nothing within me. It's all what Jesus Christ did from start to finish. He did it for me, and he's going to do it for that person too, even if that person doesn't believe right now. Jesus is the Savior of all humanity. 1 Timothy 4.10 It's like, it's like the greatest ant in the world, ant, the little insect. He's the greatest ant in the world. And because he's the greatest ant in the world, he thinks he should become human. Okay, you can be the greatest ant in the world, do all the things that ants need to do and attain the greatest position that there is for being an ant. You cannot become human unless you are completely changed and made a new creation. That's what we're doing when we say that for our good works, we do a good job and Jesus accepts us because of the work that we do. Jesus is so far above us, there's nothing we can do to ever attain what Jesus is. We have to be made a new creation and that's exactly what Jesus says he's going to do once you give up on your own righteousness and trust in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul's saying here. <clears throat> Romans is loaded. I just encourage anybody to read the book of Romans and throw off all the traditions of Christianity because this book really starts to get into what Jesus Christ is. And the first two or three chapters talk about the law and how no one could attain the law, but then it gets to a point where it says Jesus Christ this is something new. Jesus Christ completed the law. And he gives that complete law to anyone who believes. So yeah, we have to follow a standard. We have to follow a law. But no one can follow it perfectly. So you have to give up on that and realize that Jesus did it for us. So no one ever has to do anything to be saved Christ saves them. It's not that we do things to get saved. It's that we're saved. And when we come to a realization of that, then we live a life of thanksgiving and love and do good works because we're saved, not in order to get saved. And even if we don't do those good works, we're still saved because it doesn't have to do with our works. We were chosen since beginning, the beginning of time before we were even born. So there's nothing we can do to earn our salvation, there's nothing we can do to lose our salvation. It's all through Jesus Christ's choice and his process of his death, entombment, and resurrection. And really, um, there's other things here, but I, I want to close this. Um, Romans 11.32 sums it up in one verse. It says, For God locks up altogether in stubbornness that he should be merciful to all. That says it in a nutshell. Why are we evil? Why do we do bad things? For God locks us up in stubbornness. It's not us. It's God that does it to us. But not necessarily to us, but for us. Because we learn 
and we understand and we have that experience of evil so that we can enjoy the joy and the experience without evil and the, the glory of God that much more because we experience the opposite. So God locks up all together in stubbornness. That's all humanity. That he should be merciful to all. So he locks them up so that they understand the pain, the sin, the attitude, the anger, and all that crap. Why does he do that? So that he can have mercy on us. The believers first, and then everybody else, all of humanity. So that because we were locked up in all this crap, we understand how great the mercy is, and how great the life is, and how it's going to be when all that bad stuff is gone and Jesus will one day get rid of it all. And all that will be left is a perfect creation with every man, woman, and child, every creature that has ever lived reconciled to God because of the death, entombment, and resurrection of Jesus Christ.